Name one challenging thing you had to overcome in life. Life. Before we get into the interview, I'd like to tell my listeners and watchers that um, I believe you meet people for a reason. And I believe you meet people at a point in your life because they have a message for you sometimes when you need it the most. And upon hearing that message, it opens your mind just enough to see things clearly. A good friend of mine, Daniel, and his wife, Sylvia, invited me and my wife to an event at the Lyric Theater. The name of the event was An Evening of Hope and Music for the Shalva National Center. My guest, I'm, I'm sure he's heard this many times in his life, but when he shared his story, both my wife and I left rejuvenated, excited, and it reminded me why I'm doing my podcast. I was very inspired because I like to share stories of others and I like to give to those in need. Rabbi Kalman Samuels, Welcome to Real Talk with Star Scorpio. How are you doing today? I'm on with you, my friend, and that makes me feel fabulous. Amazing. Thank you for coming out today. First, let the people know where you are, because I'm in Toronto, and it's 11 o'clock. What time is it, and where are you right now? I'm in Jerusalem, the holy city in Israel, and it is seven hours Further along, it's now a little after 6 p.m. Okay, look at that time difference. Okay, so normally my podcast, what I do is build a timeline with my guest. So I ask, where were you born and raised, your schooling, and so forth. But I would love for you to share your story about your son, Yossi, your wife, Malki, and how Shava began. So we can start from the beginning because this is something I believe my listeners would like to hear. Well, as a Canadian, let me start from, you know, as they say in the beginning, let me start from where I come from, and then we'll move forward. I was born and raised in Vancouver, Canada, on the West Coast. You know, I always consider it the most beautiful city in North America. Others might not think so, but when it's pinned between the mountains and the Pacific Ocean, it's it's quite a place to be born and raised. And uh, I have a certain image today of a rabbi. That was not the case growing up. I grew up in a very typical Vancouver Jewish home, a child of the 60s, and a, not a religious home, somewhat traditional, but uh, not beyond that. And I went to all the public high schools and graduated from public high school in Vancouver in 1969. And coming out of high school, I had a number of opportunities. I had basketball scholarships to university. I had academic scholarships. I attended the first year of university at University of British Columbia and uh, studied a lot of philosophy, math, other things. And um, one of my professors in that first year used to mock in philosophy all those running to India in the day, mm -hmm. and he said that they don't have a yardstick with which to measure a, another major culture. If you want to have a yardstick, take your four years of your first degree and study seriously Western civilization so you'll know your own civilization and then be able to go to another major civilization and have an idea what it's all about. And, you know, as we all know, there were a lot of zombies running around in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, I bought into what he said, and I decided, you know, that's what I'm going to do. And my second year, I was on my way to France in the summer of 70. And my mother asked me to study. And my mother asked me to stop for two weeks in Israel on the way and visit some distant relatives we had, and I did that. And uh, in those two weeks, I had a lot of very interesting experiences. Uh, 
mm-hmm. and uh, you know slept on the beaches in a place called Elat, my magnificent beach city. Worked on uh, you know a kibbutz area in the fields in the north, and you learn a lot about a very different life than my hometown Vancouver, where everything is very pastoral and safe and quiet. And over here, things are quiet within the country, but you know it's surrounded by a lot of enemies that really wouldn't want us to be here wait so, can you tell me how old you were at the time yes i was i was 18 after first year university okay and i was on my way to study and that was the summer of 70 okay and a i had a lot of discussions with a lot of people and one interesting fellow said to me why are you going to france to study someone else's culture you don't even know your own I said, what do you mean I don't know my own? Of course, I've studied things about my own Jewish studies and everything related to that. And he made me aware pretty quickly that I wasn't too aware of the depth of what our culture bears. And uh, he offered me an opportunity in six weeks to study for six weeks with a bunch of great Ivy League guys, intellectual people who were there in this program. And I would get a good basis and then move on. I said, you know what? Sounds good. And I did it. And after doing it for six weeks, I said, well, you know what? There's more here than I had anticipated. I'm going to do it till the end of the summer, and then I'll move on. I had scholarships for second year, and I was going to go take those academic scholarships. By the end of the summer, I said, you know what? I'm not going to have an opportunity to come back here very quickly once I get into my studies. I'm going to take a year off, and I'm going to really figure this out, and then I'll move on. My father wasn't a very happy camper because I was pushing off scholarships and pushing off a year of university. But I did that. And by the end of that year, I'd actually become religious and decided that, you know what, if I'm going to be an academic, I will be an academic in the world of Jewish philosophy and Jewish uh, education, whatever it might be. And that's what I set out to do. So seven years later, I was ordained as a a rabbi and my goal was to be indeed long-term a student teacher and academic mm-hmm. en route i met my dear wife malki married began having our family and at the same time as i was getting my degree a, our second son yossi who was 11 months old it was taken by Malki to a public health center in Israel to get a routine vaccination, what's called DPT, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus. And he'd already had one. It wasn't that he hadn't had a vaccination. But unbeknownst to the public, it came out much later, the Ministry of Health was having severe problems with several batches of that vaccine over a six-month period, and many young infants were severely injured. One of those infants was my son, Yossi. Malki came home uh, from that public health center. There were no cell phones in those days. And when I got home at 7.15 from my studies, she was totally hysterical. And she took me into the little bedroom where Yossi was sleeping. He was there. And she told me hysterically, look at his eyes. And I looked at his eyes and they were glazed and they were not moving as they were in the morning when I had left him. And we started an uninvited, long journey trying to find out what was happening to our son. And uh, it was impossible to get medical information clearly because since the government was involved, they had somehow made a hush that people, doctors weren't telling you the straight goods. So we did learn that you know the first the first doctor that saw him a, a big uh, neurologist the question at was when 5 minutes later did your son recently have a triple vaccine sure doctor that's when it began but we didn't know that it could be connected what did we know mm-hmm. bottom line is we spent years struggling trying to help our son who didn't see eventually didn't hear was unable to walk was very a um, a um, overly energetic to say the least Mm -hmm. and uh, our travels took us to new york looking for medical help a year later and there we learned the hard truth that he his optic nerve is atrophy he will not ever see we learned the hard truth that he is going to be deaf and we decided to stay in new york and try and help our son and at the same time i went into the computer field 
And so we spent four and a half years in some of the finest schools in the United States for the blind and myself working and having additional children as we went. And we went back to Israel after about four and a half years in New York. And I continued in the computer field, enrolled Yossi in the deaf school in Jerusalem. And a deaf woman who was a teacher of the deaf put one of his palms on the table and in the other palm, she fingerspelled five symbols for the Hebrew letters that spell the word shulchan or table in Hebrew. And she did this days on end. And at one point, Yossi lit up and she understood that he had just had his Helen Keller breakthrough. breakthrough. Wow. Well, Several years earlier in New York, Malki had a visitor, a former teacher, a very prestigious, well-known teacher that taught her while she was in Israel. And she came to visit and see how she's doing. She'd heard about her problem. And they had a wonderful discussion. And Malki was a possibly 24, 25 years of age. And this woman was probably 50 in the prime. And uh, the woman says to her, you know, Malki, it's really not fair that you want to keep your child at home when he can't see, he can't hear. You can't put a glass on the table. You can't do anything. And it's really not fair to your husband and his brothers and sisters that they don't have a quality life. And I would suggest to you that you seek a setting outside the family setting in order that you guys can move on with your lives, your young people. <clears throat> Malki looks at this woman and says to her, you know, I, I know you know how much I respect you, but you do have one problem. You know that. She says, what problem do I have? And she says, you don't believe in God. Now, to tell that to this woman is like telling Bill Gates, buddy, you're broke. What else does she have if not her deep faith? So um, the conversation went on and it finished nicely. But Malki said, like, what are you telling me? God gives us everything. But when it's not convenient, well, you know what? We can give this away to somebody else and we'll just move on. She says, that's not what I'm doing. He's a part of me. What limb should I cut off? And that night, Malki cried a lot and said, God, I'm never going to take Yossi out of the house. It's your gift to me. I'll do everything I can for my child. But I promise you this, that if you ever decide to help my Yossi, I'm going to dedicate my life to help other mothers with their children with disabilities. So that was said. Now we're five years down the road. Yossi's eight years old. Mm -hmm. Yossi's in the deaf school. And this woman makes this Helen Keller breakthrough. Okay. On top of that... Can you give me a, a date here now? I want to make sure I got the timeline. Do you remember the year now? When that would have been? Mm -hmm. That would have been uh, 1984, 1985. Yossi was eight years old. Okay. And we had got to Israel a year earlier. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the reason it took so long was because when we tried to find Yossi a school, the deaf didn't want him. He was blind and the blind school didn't want him because he was deaf. So it took us a while to penetrate the system and get him into a school. So when she had this incredible breakthrough, she said that he's now got communication. There's nothing I cannot teach him. I can sign everything and teach him words, a table, a chair, a glass, the sky, whatever it might be. And on the basis of her work, when she taught him language, a wonderful young speech therapist said, I'm going to teach him how to speak Hebrew. And everybody sort of looked at her wondering, really? You know, the guy doesn't hear, doesn't see how you're going to penetrate with language. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, within a period of another year, she had taught him how to speak Hebrew. So now we had a child who we could fingerspell in his palm anything we wanted and tell him whatever we wanted, including I love you. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, on the other hand, could fingerspell and he could also talk. So we now had the gift of communication, which when you don't have it for seven years, is a gift that you deeply, deeply appreciate. Yeah. So Yossi became very famous. 
And, oh, excuse me. So Malki at that point sat me down mm -hmm. and said, it's payback time. I made a promise. God delivered. I know exactly what I want to do for other people. And I need your help. And I said, like, what in the world do you have in mind? So she began to describe the first program which of an organization that became known as Shalva, S-H-A-L-V-A, mm -hmm. meaning peace of mind. And what she wanted to do was to give families the peace of mind by creating a bridge program. Every child has the right to have the state of Israel pay for a school for special education for their child. But those programs finish at a young age, at one, two, two thirty, and at an older age, three, three thirty. And Malki wanted to create an after-school program where every day, every day of the week, those children didn't go home on the school bus early in the afternoon. Those children came to her program, and she gave them a blast and fun and therapy and friends and a hot meal at six o'clock. And then she bussed them home originally, initially, and later, of course, the numbers grew. We had buses. But this program proved to be a lifesaver because mommy and daddy could suddenly work a normal job mm -hmm. and come home at 5.30 or 6. The siblings could come home and have time, quality time with their parents to do homework. And when the child with a disability came home, everyone was prepared and ready for this child to give him everything he needs, but not at the cost of anybody else in that family. Mm -hmm. And my doors were being broken down by people, my phone. There were Again, there were no cell phones, so people either came to the house or people came and got my number and phoned me at home. And my, my son needs this program. The family's falling apart. My neighbor, my nephew, whoever it might have been. But the program started with five, and it became 20 and 40 and 60. And we went from one rented apartment, duplex, garden apartment, to two. And then we built our own center in the 90s. And it was, we didn't have money for major architects. Malki took a guy who knew a little bit about building, and together they built a magnificent center. Mm -hmm. And by this time, we had hundreds of kids in this center. And in 2005, the government of Israel came to me and said, We have so many children that need to get into your programs that now ran around the clock. And if we give you a big piece of land, would you build a much larger center? And I said, thank you, but no, I won't because I'm overwhelmed with what I'm doing now. And I still worked in the computer field. Mm -hmm. And um, they insisted I come see it, and I did. And it turned out to be six acres in the heart of the city. And I realized very quickly that a gift of this size to a nonprofit for kids with disabilities would never be repeated. Yeah. And I brought Malki down to see it. And we both felt the same, that it's not a crime to fail, but it would be criminal not to at least make an attempt to make this happen. So we didn't know what we were doing at this level. You know, it was something sort of out of our range, but we did it. And $70 million later, and uh, 10 years later, we completed a 220,000 square feet center which is 12 stories high it has facilities that people have not seen in the world of disabilities you know a a uh, semi-olympic indoor pool a huge huge therapy pool a full-sized gym a fitness center all this on a sports floor and then every floor has its own markings beautifully done you walk into a three-story atrium and people walk in and basically say to themselves, like, what the hell's going on? Who's... I thought I was coming to a center for disabilities. Yeah. But it's so magnificent. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, as a kid in the 60s, uh, there was a famous Torontonian, I think. His name was Marshall McLuhan, mm -hmm. a famous guy in PR. And one of his famous sayings was, the medium is the message. If you create something that presents a message of dignity, of, of respect, you don't have to talk about it. Because somebody walks in, he recognizes, oh my God, the floor is immaculate. The walls are extraordinary. They're full of art. They're full of, I mean, you're like in a place you would never believe is for kids and families with disabilities. But it is, and it's there for a reason. And 
We want people to come in. We want, first of all, the families to enjoy and have a quality life. But we want the we have 150,000 visitors a year who come to learn from Shalva from all over the world. They come to eat in our what's called the Shalva Cafe, which is a cafe that has at all times kids with disabilities working there. But it also is the finest Italian cafe in Jerusalem. So that they, they don't come for the kids, they come to eat. Yeah. But when they come, they come in the front door and they have to walk up a flight or take an elevator. And so they're automatically exposed to the environment to see a constant array of young people with disabilities having a ball and, and it just impacts people. You know, when you when you put five kids with disabilities in a classroom, you can't put more. Because if you put more, it's 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 just not going to work. But when you're talking about what we call reverse inclusion, where you build something that draws people in, typical people, into your world of disabilities, and they're like, where am I? It has enormous, enormous impact. impact. So Shalva grew, and it, it today has over 1,000 people every day coming through our doors, beginning with mothers from all over the country who just gave birth in recent weeks or months, and they come to a program called Me and My Mummy, in which each day of the week, a group, a large group of these mothers is together. They get five different therapies during the course of the first six hours of the day. Mm -hmm. They have coffee and cake together. They swim with their babies in our huge therapy pool. Mm -hmm. And mummy, who is at home alone with her child, and loneliness is what kills in this situation, mm -hmm. she suddenly has community. And she is put back on her feet very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And in a matter of weeks, she's suddenly at home feeling comfortable. She knows that there's somebody here to answer her every question. She knows she's getting the best therapy for her child, and she learns how to do what she can do. And it's just a gift. And then you have daycare, then you have preschools, then you have the after-school program we spoke about. And then you have a program that is respite in a very unique way, mm -hmm. where every day of the work week, a different set of those coming in the afternoon, every afternoon you have 300 kids from 6 to 21 coming here, and a group of those kids sleeps overnight. Mm -hmm. So when they sleep overnight, if, for example, it's a Monday, mm -hmm. it means that mummy sent her child to a school that the government provides for special ed on Monday. The school went till three o'clock. The child was then bused by that school to Shalva, what we call the Shalva National Center. Yeah. And it has an amazing time in the afternoon, sleeps overnight with his or her buddies. In the morning is bused back to school, comes back in the afternoon. So from Monday morning till Tuesday night, the parents and the siblings have two complete days off. I can't begin to tell you as a father of a child with special needs, mm -hmm. with disabilities like Yossi, what that means to a family. I didn't have it, but if there's a program that I would have wanted to have, mm -hmm. that would be it. And then we have also on weekends the respite, we have summer camps, and then what do you do with young people who are now 21 mm -hmm. and they're sort of out of the regular programs? So we have vocational training. We have an enormous vocational training staff. We place these young people in jobs in, in, in the organization. There are many working here in different capacities, but also we train them and place them elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So it's Shalva has become what they called a global model of excellence. We're a consultant to the United Nations. A, two weeks ago, I hosted probably... 30 different nations from Europe and from the Far East who were here for a three-day conference on what's called uh, accessibility. Mm -hmm. When you build buildings for people, you try and make them accessible. They should, right. even though they may have a particular a disability or be in a wheelchair, they should be able to get everywhere in that building. Mm -hmm. So this building is completely accessible. Mm -hmm. And they came here at the end of their conference to see it. And a... Uh, it was totally amazing to see their reactions. One of them, I won't mention the country, but a significant country in Europe is redoing its capital building. And the architect and uh, the lady running the project were here as part of this group. And they're begging me to come and come to their capital and 
sort of show them how to do it. So I said to them, listen, I, I appreciate the flattery, but trust me, I don't know too much about the subject. I hired experts <laughs> who taught us how to do it. Yeah. But, the, but, but the important thing is, I said, mm -hmm. is that you have to have a will to do it because it costs more and you may have to redesign things. But if you have the will to do it, trust me, there are experts that we can send them to you, what have you, that can help you, you know, design your building in such a way. Mm -hmm. So Shalva today, what can I tell you? It's, it's grown from five kids to, as I say, over a thousand a day. And we serve the entire population. First come, first serve. There's no, there's not one ethnic group that is mm -hmm. not represented here. That's amazing. So common, what, what I want to know, this is the same feeling I was getting that night. What I want to know, and I want you to tell me about Yossi and, and what he's doing now and his experiences, but tell me something. When did you get used to hearing the emotional stories? Because the impact you have on the parents, and I believe there was a story in the pamphlet that I got that night for the event, the emotional stories from the, the parents when they get to send their kids to a place like Shalva and the relief they have and the love they have mm -hmm. and the caring, I would feel like I would be emotional every time, but I think I'd be numb to it because I'm like, oh yes, I understand and I'm happy now. But is there a point when you you stop feeling that emotion because now you just understand, yep, we're helping you out? People ask me all the time, what drives me? Mm -hmm. I'm doing this for 33 years and I'm, you know, we have a big budget, $22 million, 500 employees, most of who are educational employees working with the kids. And, you know, some of that's provided by the government, some of that's generated by our cafe, but $7 million a year has to be raised in order just to fill that gap. Yours truly, with the help of some others, is the forefront of trying to make that happen. And it doesn't come easy and it requires a lot of travel, and it required a lot of travel at all times, even when I was working in the computer field. And my children didn't see me as much as I would have liked them to see me because I was always somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, but what drives me is it precisely what you just said. I said, look, I have a child, and thank God my wife and I were able to cope and able to move forward wasn't easy, and no one will ever underestimate the challenges of what that means to every family, including ours. Um, but when you see others facing similar situations with all kinds of you know disabilities, and, and the disabilities I'm talking about for Shalva start with a cognitive disability. Mm -hmm. Many, 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 or most of our children have physical disabilities as well but they all have the component of some kind of cognitive disability, whether it's, you know, more profound, less profound. And when you're able to help another human being and, and someone says something like that to you, it never, ever, ever ceases to excite you, to thank God, thank God for something that you're able to do something on this world to help somebody else. And, it's somebody else who I know what they're going through because I've been through it. So it's, it's, you know, this happens daily. It happens 10 times a day where mothers see me, fathers, what, whatever it might be, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, in Shalva, obviously people know who I am. So it's, it's sort of a constant kind of thing. And, you know, one, one woman said to me uh, not too long ago, she was wheeling out her little baby who was quite severely you know, with a disability, mm -hmm. and the little baby was probably 10 months old, and she'd been coming for the last five, six months to this program for early mothers. And as I'm walking out the door, she's walking in, and she's walking out, and I'm walking in, yeah, and she suddenly gets very emotional. You're, you're the director of this place. I, you're the director, right? Mm. I said, yes, I am. She says, you're going, you're going right to heaven. You're going right to heaven. I said, listen, I really don't know what the story is, but I do have one request. She says, what's that? Could you please have a bit of patience? I still want to stay here a while. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the kinds of reactions <laughs> yeah. that, that people have because it's a lifesaver, you know? So it's delightful. And, you know, let's just let's just live a nice life here in the meantime. <laughs> you have a sense of humor. Um, 
can you tell me about Yossi now? Like some of the things that he's done, because this is amazing um, from his beginnings. And let me know what he's been through in life. Yossi is today 46. Mm -hmm. Yossi, Yossi, in spite of his not being able to see, hear, or being able to walk, he walked as a teenager, but, you know, we he lost his ability to walk uh, again through a medical procedure that didn't go well and uh, it, it, it impacted his balance mm -hmm. uh, and that was about the age of 23 so he lost with finality his ability to walk and he is in a wheelchair which for him was a hugely hugely challenging thing mm -hmm. but Yossi when he was small he friends in the neighborhood the neighbor, friends in the neighborhood, young kids, learned how to speak to him because all it took was 22 symbols. So if you can spell 22 symbols, you know the language. You, as a child especially, you learn how to spell that quickly. Mm -hmm. And as my wife Malki always says, Yossi speaks a thousand languages because everyone has a different hand and everyone f f creates the letters in his hand differently mm -hmm. and he picks it up instantly. Uh, and even when we do sign, people are always amazed how quickly we sign, so, you know, r rattling it off. Yeah. And Someone pointed out a number of years ago to me that y Yossi is, is a genius in the sense that we don't stop with punctuation or spaces or anything else. It's just like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. And he's breaking that down in real time into words, into sentences, and understanding it very clearly. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, these kids got to know him and to speak to him, and he had friends. And they used to take him up and down the neighborhood. And they one day were touching cars, and he asked, what's this? And he's, they said, let's say a Ford. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he went to another car and another car. They gave him the names and three, four cars down the road. They gave him, he touched the car and he says, Ford. And they said, I like, how do you know that? So he says, the door handles are the same. And this began a great journey of Yossi identifying cars and learning every car in the neighborhood. Then it went to dealerships. And then it went to dealerships in other cities, bigger dealerships. And he knew everything. He, he just had it like any kid. He had a great thirst to know about cars and he knew engine sizes they read him every magazine that you could imagine and his favorite car was volvo mm -hmm. and one day he met a guy who was talking to him and he said what's with your son and i explained to him mm -hmm. and uh, then yossi touched his hand and met him so he started as he always does investigating him who are you what's your name what do you do mm -hmm. uh, what kind of car do you drive what kind of telephone do you have and a big PR guy who he did this to went crazy. He says, those are the exact questions we in the PR, in the analysis, you know, marketing business, yeah. this is what we ask. You know, yeah. what do you do? You know, what do you, what's, what's your education? What do you do? You know, what kind of car do you drive? And what up? <laughs> yeah. So yes, he put a profile together. Yeah. And it's very funny because he once had a visitor who told him he was a school teacher mm -hmm. and he drove a Ferrari and Yossi went nuts says, that's impossible so the guy says to me tell your son before I was a 50 year old school teacher I did some business too <laughs> oh, <laughs> so right. I was able to buy that Ferrari <laughs> of course oh wow so at any rate Yossi met this guy with the Volvo mm -hmm. and uh, told him he told him he had a Volvo and he went told him how much he loves Volvos and he said you know what I was just in Sweden and I met the head of Volvo I'm going to make your son a meeting so six months later Yossi was invited to Volvo in Sweden and I went out with him and he had what we really call a hands-on you know doesn't here see a hands-on visit yeah. from scrap metal building the Volvo the machines putting in the dashboard hitting the buttons to the software goes swooping down into the dashboard mm -hmm. and I was he was able to stand in those days and all the heads of Volvo were there they used it for their PR mm -hmm. but wonderful people and they got used to the gig that he would I would talk to him and he would and I would explain in English so we were putting in a dashboard I was standing behind him to hold him straight mm -hmm. and he had an electric screw a screwdriver and putting in the screws on the dashboard mm -hmm. and he completed it and uh, he looks over his shoulder and he says something to me and he said what did he say I said well he said what did he say he said uh, what are they going to tell their buyer of this Volvo about their quality control? In other words, a deaf-blind kid put it together. Yeah. So, yeah. so they were rolling and laughing, and the mascara was coming off the eyes of some of the ladies. <laughs> and a few months later, I was in New York at a friend's house, mm -hmm. and we were talking, and there was a lot of people at the table, and uh, I told him the story. Mm. And he says to me, Kalman, I've had a new Volvo, an S80, 
that Yossi put together for the last three months. It has been a lemon from the day I got it, and I realize now that this is the one Yossi put together. So Yossi put Volvos together. Yossi continued. Mm -hmm. Yossi has a sense of smell like a bloodhound. When his brothers and sisters opened a can of Coke in the next room, he would yell, I want a can of Coke too. Wow. He smelled it. So we thought in terms of perfumes, but someone told us that what he could do mm -hmm. is that he could be a wine taster because taste is a function of smell. Mm -hmm. So we hired the best prize young wine tasting, a sommelier in Israel at that time, 2007, and he taught Yossi for two years about wine and, you know, how to be a sommelier. Mm -hmm. Yossi has since put out two wines of his own. Wow. And uh, it's called, of course, Handshake. Mm -hmm. And uh, his name is on it. It's in Braille. On the site, explains about the wine in Braille. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you a funny story there, too. The head of the Israeli Air Force visited and met Yossi a year ago. And he was enthralled with Yossi. Mm -hmm. And he... Yossi gave him a bottle of wine. And a few weeks later, uh, I heard from him, and he said, I want to tell you a funny story. I was in, in the interim, I was in Europe, and I met with the head of the American Air Force forces in Europe. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, traditional, you bring a gift. So I brought him a bottle of wine. So the guy looks at the bottle of wine, and he, he thinks this must be who knows what, you know, what kind of wine would he have brought me? Right. So he's looking and looking and looking, and he says, like, forgive me, but, like, explain to me what's special about this wine. Mm -hmm. He says, well, put your hand on the side. And he rubs his hand, doesn't know what he's touching. He says, that's Braille. This wine was made by a blind, deaf friend of mine. <laughs> so, so since then, the Air Force welcomes all their guests who come to Israel with one a bottle Wait. of one of Yossi's wine. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's but yes, he listen. One of the things Yossi does, he works. Yossi yeah. works several times a week. He puts together three piece easy passes. It's manual, but he puts it together very well. Mm -hmm. And if you meet Yossi, the first thing he will tell you is what he does, because we realize from this mm -hmm. how Yossi is a he, the pride he has in being able to contribute and being a typical Joe working and contributing and i learned from that i mean i know these things but on a personal level i learned that we talk about inclusion and we all work very hard and do a great job mm -hmm. but inclusion is not complete until you found a way to enable that individual to contribute in some meaningful way so that he has the dignity of being a contributed member of our society. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just incredible to understand the significance of helping young people with disabilities, you know, get the capabilities as we do and get on and work. But Yossi, you know, he's met President Bush. He's met the Prime Minister of England, Gordon Campbell. Mm -hmm. He's been hosted by people all over the world. He loves to travel. He came back from England two weeks ago. He flew with two buddies mm -hmm. and uh, they just had five, six days in London. It was pretty cold, but uh, he's just a regular Joe. He's got his own iPhone mm -hmm. and he can't see the iPhone, of course. Mm -hmm. But what happens is, you know, he tells whoever he's with, send a text to this one, send to this one, to that one. Someone texts him, it's read to him. Someone calls him, he gets on the phone, he talks about his monologue, what he's doing. They talk about what the other guy's doing. And he's got, I don't want to say thousands, but he probably has a thousand friends that are just crazy about this guy yeah you 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 did t thanks for sharing that you did tell a story about a horse the last story i want you to share is you'll see in the horse like can you tell that story again i sure can mm -hmm. you also always rides horses he's ridden horses for you know it's great for balance and he's ridden horses since he's small mm -hmm. but he always dreamt of riding an elephant and elephants, we didn't know how to help him because the closest place to Israel to ride elephants is Kenya. And in Kenya, to ride an elephant, you need an enormous number of vaccinations beforehand. Okay. So we lost that Russian roulette with that vaccination. Mm -hmm. We weren't about to give him vaccinations that aren't necessary unless you're going to travel there. Mm -hmm. So at some point, a, my wife got an email from a friend of Yossi's who had worked with him and knew him very well. That and the email said, basically, Malki, I'm in Thailand. There are elephants. Vaccines are not needed. I'm here for another three weeks. Send me Yossi immediately. Mm -hmm. So Thailand is further 10 hours further east and uh, on a plane. Mm -hmm. it's a plane on a, so it's a pretty hard call how you're going to get Yossi there. But together they got a third friend, another friend 
who agreed that he's going to take Yossi out there. Mm -hmm. So literally a few days later, Yossi got on a plane and flew to Thailand. And in the meantime, a couple of days later, I was hosting three American congressmen at Shalv in the older center. And I told my secretary, please just don't let anyone bother us for 20 minutes. I'll tell them an overview and I'll take them on a short tour of the center. So thank you. Closes the door. Two minutes later, there's a knock. It's her. She says very emotionally, for God's sakes, please look at your email. Mm -hmm. And I really have no idea what she's talking about. I excused myself and I looked at that email. And in that email, I saw a photo of Yossi with his two buddies on top of a very large elephant. And Yossi was smiling from ear to ear. So I actually broke down. I mm -hmm. apologized to the congressman. And I shared a little bit of the background. And I said, gentlemen, if there's anyone who has no reason to dream, it's Yossi. He can't get out of bed in the morning himself, can't go to the bathroom. He needs help to help him get up, get out, and go to the washroom. He needs help with everything in his life. He's rarely down. He loves life, and he always has new dreams. He never stops dreaming, and the incredible thing is that, by and large, he realizes those dreams. So I said, we as mature adults, I think we sometimes slow down or cease to dream. Mm -hmm. And I want to encourage you, and I encourage every young person I talk to, lecture to, to dream, go after your dreams, and don't let anyone get in the way of you and your dreams. Because you don't want to look back at life and say, oh, I lived a life of dreams. But you know what? They weren't really my dreams. Mm -hmm. You come down once, live it, you got a dream, someone doesn't quite think it's realistic, that's his problem. You'll find out, you'll try it. If it doesn't work out, you'll know, but go for it. In my case, I never had those dreams. In my case, I wrote a book called Dreams Never Dream. Because as a young, non-religious kid in Vancouver, trust me, I never thought about looking like this. I never thought about living in Israel, yeah. never being religious. And when Yossi was injured, my wife and I could never have dreamed that one day we'll be able to talk to him again. Mm -hmm. And when he had that breakthrough, we could never have dreamed that with what Shalva started with five kids, it's now probably the largest in the world. So, you know, it's like things you cannot ever, ever, you know, realize. Wow. I'm, I, I'm glad you shared that because I usually ask my guests to share words of inspiration for someone that is about to give up hope or on the brink of quitting something, but you actually touched on it. So that was amazing. Thanks for sharing that. So the last thing, Kalman, we're going to do, I have two cards in my hand and I'm going to read one out to you and you tell me which one by the right or the left that you want me to read. Which one? That you want me to read out. Let's, to let's take, let's take your right. Okay. <clears throat> This always happens. It's, it's, it's kind of fitting, but let's see what you say. Name one challenging thing you had to overcome in life. Life. <laughs> There's a first for everything. It's, it's, it's been a life of overcoming, you know. Yeah. Listen, it's like, it's not just Yossi, but we mm -hmm. built this place. Mm -hmm. It was hard enough doing everything we did. A big old hotel above us, nearby us, decided they didn't want us here. The kids not to be in their neighborhood. And they fought us in 15 different legal courts. The city should not be able to give us the land that they wanted to give us. Mm -hmm. And it was insane. We were like little David against big wealthy Goliath and trying to fight and stop us. From. And so it's like, as, as Malki said, you know, one of the things she could never have imagined in life you just want to help people, mm -hmm. but it comes with so many challenges, not connected to the kids, yes. connected to people who just don't want to let you do what you want to do. Yes. So God, I just want to rephrase that. Life is wonderful. And I was half joking when I said that, yeah. but it's, it's the challenges. And I will say something, and it's very strange what I'm about to say, but take it in the way I mean it. Okay. A dear friend once said to me, in New York, he says, Kalman, I have so many problems. And I don't know why I said it, but I said to him, I said, 
I'm so happy for you. And he says, Kamala, are you out of your mind? I said, no, Joe, I worry for the guy with one problem. We all have many problems. And that's the story of life, coping, dealing with things, knowing there's a better day tomorrow, knowing that we can make it happen, knowing that we're growing with every challenge we have. But I worry for the person that his life is now preoccupied with one problem. It might be a health problem, might be a health problem of a child, but he can't think about anything else in life at this point. That is a problem. The problems you're having, Joe, and the problems I'm having, that's a sign of life. And let's just take them on, move with them, and, you know, have the, the, the trust and the faith that, God willing, we're going to get through this. And we're going to do good things. Amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Um, this has been a great, great podcast. Before I go, you know, I always donate to a charity at the end of every podcast. So who will Star Scorpio be donating to for season five, episode 11? You know, there's so many options out there, but I don't know their address. So why don't we just go with Canadian friends of Shalva? There you go. <laughs> Again, I'll be donating to. So now I want you to, because there's a, a chapter here. There's an organization, an operation, Shalva, here in Toronto. So I want you to plug that. Um, where can people donate? Let people know what Shalva is doing here before we go. Canadian friends of Shalva, they will find the office in Canada. You donate, you want a tax receipt, that money must be deposited in Canada. And we have a recognized Canadian uh, organization. If someone wants to get involved, we have a director of Shalva. Uh, her name is Joanna. Right. And mm -hmm. I invite each and every one of your listeners, when you're in Israel, Come to Israel, come to Jerusalem. It's the most amazing place. And when you come, please come visit. Amazing. Thank you. So this is Real Talk with Star Scorpio, Season 5, Episode 11 with Kalman. Amazing. Thank you for coming out today. And we out. <laughs>